anyone who's a Ranger fan knows that there's breaking news, and we're just going to hit it straight off the top. Obviously, Chris Jury kind of dropped the bombshell today on us uh, a little bit around noon, one o'clock ish, trading for Vladimir Tarasenko and Nico Mikola from the St. Louis Blues. It, it was a trade that actually, believe it or not, Molly and Larry had spoken about on the podcast, but uh, that now we hit control delete on that podcast, as Molly and Larry both know from game notes whenever there's a, uh, a game that goes overtime. But we're here to talk about it now. And, um, you know, again, like I said, Vladimir Tarasenko, Nico Mikola, in exchange for a first round pick in the 2023 NHL draft, as well as a conditional fourth round pick, Sammy Blay going, as well as Hunter Skinner. And uh, Molly picked up on the source that the Blues are going to be retaining 50% of the salary, which is huge for the Rangers salary cap because we all know about their issues that they have. So this was a great move in my mind, at least from Chris Jury, a move that, you know, obviously kind of takes him out of the Patrick Kane situation. But you know what? I like this a lot. You're bringing in a big time player, a guy, Stanley Cup experience, 30 plus goal score for six of his, you know, time, six years in, in the NHL. So the guy knows what he's doing. He's going to play off the line perfectly, I think, with Mika and whatnot. So, Molly, news of the day here. Break it mm-hmm. down for us. There's so much to like about this deal that general manager and president Chris Jury pulled off today. I mean, it fills their biggest needs, a hole on the right wing in the top six and on the left side of the bottom defensive pair. And he was able to get a guy like Tarasenko while also preserving key players who are currently in the lineup, but also squeezing the added bonus of more defensive depth in the process. Uh, So there's just so much to like. Like you said, it does kind of take them out of the Patrick Kane sweepstakes, but arguably a bit of a trade up for a guy like Vladimir Tarasenko. Um, I guess we could just go right into the conditions of everything. There's a lot of moving parts, so I'll try to break it down as seamlessly as possible. But yes, they were the Blues retained 50 percent of the last year of Tarasenko's contract, which is a seven point five million dollar cap hit. Um, the Rangers made room for him and uh, and Nico by uh, waving Libor Hayek and they sent Will Cooley back to AHL Hartford. So they were able to make room for both of those guys. Um, the first round pick will be the latter of the Rangers two in the 2023 NHL draft, either their own or the one that they received from the stars in exchange for Nils Lundqvist earlier this season. If Dallas does end up having a top 10 pick, it will shift to next year and be the latter of those two picks. Um, The fourth rounder in 2024 will also become a third round pick if the Rangers make the playoffs this season, which I don't like to be in the business of jinxing anybody, but that's a pretty solid bet that you can make. Um, We've seen this before with Jury where he makes a condition conditions like this. And it's very strategic and it's very smart. Um, And I feel like it, it also helped them get um, Nico McCola in the, in the deal as well, which I feel like judging by what we heard from jury today, that was a a big sweetener for the pot for them. I mean, they did just extend Ben Harper, but Ben Harper is probably more of a number seven defenseman rather than the sixth guy that they want next to Braden Schneider. So um, we'll all get our first look at Tarasenko and uh, McCola in Rangers sweaters Friday night against Seattle Kraken. There's been so much going on. I almost forgot who they were playing on Friday. <laughs> um, so very exciting. Uh, this is exactly what the Rangers needed. So there's so much to like about it. I mean, Larry, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on the deal. It is kind of funny that we literally were talking about this earlier today, that Tarasenko would probably be be the guy that the Rangers want to bring in. And, and here we are. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, I listen, I like it. I, I mean, you, you, you guys have, have, uh, have both written my columns for me, <laughs> your comments, but no, I like it. Um, what I think it does. First of all, I, I love the fact that it's, it's now and it, it gives Tarasenko gives Nicola, but Tarasenko primarily um, time to acclimate. And I think that's really important because, you know, and I referenced this, uh, you know, a week or so ago when I wrote um, when Marty St. Louis came um, to the Rangers at the deadline in 14, 
he scored one goal in 19 games and and you could see he just it was very very difficult he'd, he'd come from a place he'd been forever and it takes time to adjust and this extra three weeks before the deadline that tarasenko is now going to have i think is is vital um it t- and it, it you know it, it also allows the rangers to solidify their top line their top nine they have been unstable unsettled all year it's almost remarkable that they have the record they do they, they have the seventh best record in the league and yet they i don't think they've played a hockey for you know for much of the year i i don't think they've been at their best for much of the year so um you can look at it as you know two ways that they haven't gotten to their best and they're not going to mm-hmm. and this is you know what you see is what you get or look at what they've done without being at their best and when they kick in the gear they're going to be a very very dangerous team i think a lot of that goes to stability and i think and i i i hope that the coach <sighs> looks at his lineup now and sees a top 9 that he is not going to fiddle with every game, or if it doesn't go well for two games, there's going to be an immediate switch. It's going to be, I, you know, I think, and, and I think it's it's obvious, and and this is what I'd look at. I think it's going to be Panarin, Zabanajad, Tarasenko, Lafreniere, Hedl, Kako, Trocheck between Kreider and either VC or Goodrow, with the other dropping down and forth. But their top nine now should just go every game. This is, this you know, barring injury, is just roll them out, roll them out, roll them out. And what I think this does, um, in addition to giving stability to the team, which they haven't had, is that it gives Panarin somebody to play with. And I think, you know, Panarin's a guy who doesn't love change, and that's all he's had this year. Yeah. You know, he's had to, you know, he's got a new center. Hasn't worked that great, you know. No need to assign blame. It just, you know, the the Panarin Trocheck connection just hasn't worked so far this year, and and um, so Panarin's been, you know, playing on different combinations with different centers, and he's been moving here and there. He hasn't reacted all that well, and you know, he hasn't had an especially good season. <laughs> you know, he's having a good season, obviously. You know, he's in the All Star game. He puts up points, but he's been off. And I think he's been off just about all year. And I think, you know, bringing in Tarasenko, somebody he's friendly with, somebody he's played with in the past in international events, someone who sees the game the same way as he does, will will be a major boost for him. And I think it's important that the Rangers have Panarin at their best. You know, they're not going anywhere. if They don't have Artemi Panarin at his best. And that means being better than he was in last year's playoffs. And I think Tarasenko... Um, is a guy who can help him. He's a he's a he's a uh, competitive guy, Tarasenko. He can win battles. Um, you know, he gets to the net, and he's an elite goal scorer. Um, not having a great year, but there's a lot going on in St. Louis this year. And again, for you know, they they didn't have to give up any of their prize prospects. They didn't give up the better of of the two first rounders they had. Yeah. And they and in addition, as as you mentioned, getting the defenseman was was an important part of the deal. Um, ben Harper is more suited to being a seventh defenseman, and I think the Rangers are going to need to add another defenseman because if you're going into the playoffs and and you fancy yourselves as a team that's going to make a run, which they do, you need nine, ten NHL caliber defensemen there. So I would expect them to to be looking for another defenseman. I'd also be um, expecting, uh, I also expect them to look to uh, add to the fourth line because the fourth line right now is is pretty open as to how they're going to uh, construct that. So, but but to me, the you know the, the key is, I look at now a top nine that can be stable and just roll them out every night. If they lose tomorrow night against Seattle. Don't change it Saturday against Carolina. <laughs> no, really. If, don't if hold they, your breath. You know, if they struggle on sa- on Saturday, don't change it. You know, next week when they go to the coast, uh, when they go out west to Canada. I, you know, this is their team. You know, this is their top nine. This is it. So go with it. Give them time. Allow them to, you know, allow them to become comfortable with each other. And, you know, a Panarin, Zibanejad, Tarasenko first line is pretty formidable. It, it just is. And, and you know, 
we've, we've, we've talked about how the Rangers are just now finding ways to win games, even though they're not playing all that well. But one guy who's playing well is Ibanejad. Mm-hmm. He's playing really well. And so I think he is up for it to be, you know, between Tarasenko and Panarin. He'll figure it out. He's smart enough. And again, these extra three weeks before the deadline give, give them a, a cushion on, on getting these guys acclimated. I think it's a, I think it's a terrific deal. I totally agree. I'm I'm very excited to see what Tarasenko looks like on the other side of Artemi Panarin. Drury yeah. told us today that he had a conversation with Artemi, a brief conversation about it. Obviously, like you mentioned, they're buddies from from playing internationally for Team Russia. Um, and if you know the Rangers couldn't get out and get his old pal Patrick Kane in Chicago, then I feel like Tarasenko is probably the next best guy. But you know, kind of like you mentioned, Tarasenko is having a bit of a down year, 10 goals, 19 assists in 38 games, but he was still within the Blues top five point producers, which doesn't really say a lot because of the season that they're having in St. Louis, but it's still notable, I feel. So I, I, I think it's well, you know, good. you know, you know what, you know what, too is going to be interesting because Tarasenko obviously is going to go on the first power. Play. I was just that was you, you know, you're just reading my mind, but go ahead, you know, that was the question because that 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 is the question, and I tried right. to get it out of jury today, right? But of course, jury is is always going to say that it's a uh, Galant's lineup, and well, he says that because it, it honestly is true. It's true, yeah. You know, it, it is true. I I know there there is a lot of of. You know, there are a lot of conspiracy, you know, theories <laughs> out there that jury, you know, instructs Gallant on, on right. who to play, where to play them. I I I I reject all of that. I mean, yeah. because it is important that there is a line between the GM and the coach. You can't give a coach an excuse to lose. You can't tell a coach to play a player, then the team loses, and then blame the coach. Right. Then the coach says, well, wait a second. I didn't Yeah, want it was the gym. <laughs> your lineup. It's not my lineup. So there, there is a delineation in responsibility. And and it is Glant's authority to make the lineup and 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 you know to to use the personnel as as he sees fit. But believe me, they didn't bring in Tarasenko to be on the second power play playing 27 yeah. seconds. You know, power I don't play. I don't think so either. But I no, mean, so they're going to bring him in. And, the, you know, this is going to be also. This is also refers to the timing of the deal because they're going to change their power play. Right They're They're you know, I assume. And, you know, you can you can you know, you can kind of make a fool of yourself by assuming. <laughs> but but I assume that Trocek's dropping off. That he's, you know, that Tarasenko would replace. No, Trump. that's 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 the one so, that makes sense. Um, so then, you know, so now you don't have the four righties anymore for the first time in, you know, three or four I years. I was going to say a couple so of years. An adjust- yeah, there's going to be an adjustment period. I mean, really, since Thanksgiving of uh, 2019, they've gone with four righties when everyone's been healthy. You know, David Quinn put it together. They were their bo- best four offensive players, um, forwards, Ryan Strom included. And so they've, they've rolled with four righties for three years. So now it's going to be an adjustment period um, to work that power play. But listen, we all know that the four righty um, approach this year has gotten stale. Um, they've gotten a little predictable. They've gotten a little bit slow and methodical. So I think this will give a jolt to the power play too. Um, but again, it, it's, it's um, you know, Gerard Gallant has his own ways of doing things. Um, but I know he hasn't enjoyed switching the lines every game. And it, like no coach wants to do that. And, and you know, I, I think that, you know, bringing in Tarasenko, um, giving a legitimate top line player here um, just, just, you know, gives them a roadmap for success. Go with your top nine and then fill out the fourth line. So here's another question for you. I don't know if you can read my mind, but obviously he is going to, Tarasenko is going to be a UFA at the end of this season. Do you think there's a world in which he stays with the Rangers? Is that no. even possible? Yeah. No, no I think this is a, a strict rental. Pure rental. Yeah. The, yeah, I think it's a pure rental. The Rangers just don't, won't have the space to accommodate yeah. him each year. I, I, I don't think they're, are any illusions on either side? He's, you know, I think Tarasenko is coming here to win a cup. He won one uh, with St. Louis. I think he's coming here to win a cup and to uh, uh, build his market value. You know, mm-hmm. a great run for him, 
enhances his value over the, over the summer. So no, I, I think this is a short term marriage, both for Tarasenko and for Mikola. Uh, you know, the, the Rangers won't be able to afford Mikola either next year as a third pair defenseman. They're they're not going to be in the business of adding, you know, players who are making two point five million dollars or whatever, you know, on their lefty. I'd like to add that Tarasenko, not only is he a Stanley Cup winner, but he is a proven playoff contributor in general. 41 goals and 90 mm-hmm. postseason games over nine seasons in St. Louis. I mean, that that's that's huge. That could yeah. be real. That could be the difference for the Rangers, you know, between an Eastern Conference yeah. final finish and a Stanley Cup final finish. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's yeah. I, don't, I, don't, I see no, I really see no drawbacks to this. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's, yeah. That's something that, that I was actually going to ask, Larry, and I'm kind of curious. In terms of the Rangers, yeah, they do have playoff experience. Obviously, they had a lot last year. But in terms of having a Stanley Cup champion on the team, how does that help in terms of, like, is it something that Tarasenko can give advice or, like, that just that extra motivation factor that, that hey, this guy's done it. You know, we can kind of lean on him and kind of show us the way in that sense. Does it do that for them a little bit? I think I think there is – leadership by example i think you know i i think the confidence he has probably um emanates and and other p- players can pick up on it um i don't i don't know that because he won the cup you know that's going to have any influence on panarin or zivanejad but it's always good to it's always good to have guys in the room who have won who understand what it takes um i think that was you know certainly one of barkley goodrow's you know, it is one of Barkley Goodrow's great attributes is that he's been through this. He's won twice. He was able to, to lend that to the team last year. I think it's important to have guys who have won. Um, but I, I think as much for what they contribute individually as how it rubs off on the rest of the team. I, I Again, though, I, I think it's all leadership by example. And so, you know, if Tarasen- Tarasenko obviously knows how to play in the playoffs. And so maybe the younger guys take a look at him, pick something up from him when they're going through the grind. Again, uh, you know, last year, the experience that Kako and Heedle and Lafreniere got last year in, in the playoffs, it has helped to a certain extent during this regular season, but I think where really will pay off is in the playoffs this year because they've been through it. They know it. They know how to play in the playoffs. And, you know, any any time you have, have players with successful playoff experience, it's it's an, an asset. Looking at the hall going the other way to St. Louis, Sammy Blay on his yeah. way back to where he began his career. Kind of a an unfortunate way to end. I mean, 54 games, nine assists, one season completely lost to injury. Yeah. yeah. I just it's it's unfortunate, but I think Jury hit the nail right on the head uh, today when he said that he feels like sending him back to a familiar f- place could help him. Just curious on your thoughts on his overall tenure with the Rangers and what it could mean for him going forward. You know, we'll we'll it, it'll be one of those what ifs. Um, what if he hadn't gotten hurt? Right. Because as 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 we you know have, have spoken about before. He was on the top line when he got hurt. They had just moved him up to play with Kreider and Zibanejad. You know, a power winger playing with Kreider and Zibanejad. And he was, he had never played on the fourth line last year. You know, he had played with Hedl and Lafreniere. It was, it was a pretty good combination. And then, of course, the Rangers were looking for a right wing to play with Kreider and Zibanejad. And they moved him up. And, and it was a very... Um, um, inviting prospect that they were going to have this power guy fast and big who was going to get in on the four check clear out space for them um, and then he got hurt in 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 that game he got he hurt in the third game he was on the first line and you, you don't know what he would have been you just don't know what he would have been um, it, it's 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 really sad it, it's unfortunate for him I, you know, his earning power is, is now devalued. Um, he's going to be a free agent over the summer. Who knows? Hope, you know, for his sake, you know, he gets in a regular rhythm in St. Louis and, and is comfortable and, and, you know, goes on to the market with something behind him. Um, the, the one thing is Shane Churler's record 
of, of being the Ranger forward who played the most games in his career without scoring a goal is now safe. He played, <laughs> he played 55 games. No and, way. And, and play ends with 54. So, so Jane Sherla <laughs> remains safe. in the record books. <laughs> this is but why, you know, what's funny, Blay, is this it? is why you're here. This is why yeah, <laughs> no other podcast is dropping that kind That's, of knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but you know, I mean, he, he was a, you know, a well-intentioned, he is a well-intentioned yeah. young, young of man. Course. You know, um, I, I, you know, I think um, the abuse he got from fans because he came for in, in the Buknevich trade was, you know, it's unfortunate. You understand it. Um, hope he didn't take it personally because I'm sure it was never was meant personally. Um, but he was just a guy who worked hard, suffered a devastating setback and, so far, really hasn't been able to overcome it. You know, hopefully for his sake, he will in the next couple of months. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that over the summer when I spoke to him heading into this season, um, coming off of his ACL injury, I asked him if he felt any added pressure coming to New York as part of that trade, you know, for a guy like Pavel Buchnevich, who was obviously a fan favorite and, you know, was doing great things for the Rangers. And I mean, obviously he could have been lying <laughs> naturally, but he said he always tried not to think about it like that. But you're right. He did catch a lot of abuse from the yeah, fan base and, just and, for being know, part of it. Yeah, I, I remember like early last season um, in they played a game in Nashville that, that you didn't go to and I did. And he he was on the line with Heedle and Lafreniere and, and they, you know, he, he it was a good game. He played well. And I remember talking to him after the game was, it was, you know, the mass press conference because of mm -hmm. COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he was, you know, he was a bullion. I mean, you know, the Rangers were giving him a shot not to just be a fourth line plugger. Right. And he and Lafreniere had developed some chemistry. He was a really a very personable, you know, had a lot of personality. Yeah. And then the injury happened and, and, his, and his whole, you know, career kind of came to a crashing uh, pause, um, mm -hmm. let's say. And um just, just you know, you know, my interactions with him were were always enjoyable. He, you know, he, he, you know, you knew he wanted to please. He wanted to, you know, he wanted to um, give something back. Um, so I hope he does well. Me too. Um, speaking of the fourth line, I feel like naturally that's where general manager Chris Jury's yeah. attentions are going to be now going forward between now and the March third deadline. You know, it's funny. I saw a lot of people on Twitter that we're like, all right, so we could bring Tyler Mott back now. Right? <laughs> and, I, but I feel like they do need a Tyler Mott kind of guy to plug in on the fourth line. And it's probably somebody with a similar price tag. You could see that happening. Yeah, I could. Um, I, I'm not sure how they envision their fourth line at this point. Yeah. And, and again, it'll, it'll be interesting to see um, tomorrow. And, and, and this could change. I mean, I, you know, I, I don't want to say that Gallant makes any changes, you know, it's, it's, you know, you know, it, you know, he, you know, he, sh he should be, you know, fired. Um, mm. But, but the decision between dropping VC and Goodrow is, is an interesting one to me mm -hmm. because if VC drops, then he's going on the wing. And if Goodrow drops, I would have moved, you know, I guess he could go on the wing, but I'm thinking of him as a fourth line center. Um, so if VC's there, then they may have different needs. If Goodrow's there, then they may have different needs. So I'm not sure what they're looking for. I, you know, it's not going to be a, a especially physical fourth line now. I don't think. I don't think they have enough to. Um, I don't think they're going to have enough cap space um, to acquire two more forwards to play in the fourth. So we're probably looking at one. So is Gautier going to play? Um, I don't think Kravtsov is playing on the fourth line. You know, could they even give Kravtsov a shot on the third line and move both VC and Goodrow to the fourth? Probably not, but maybe that's an option for them to take a look at over the next week or two. You know, when they're when they're moving onto the deadline, I, I think it's 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 wide open their fourth line. I I don't know exactly how they're going to deal with it, but listen, if, if they can get Tyler Mott for a reasonable price, <laughs> Tyler Mott would, would you know, <laughs> right. Tyler Mott would be, would be an impressive addition. It would be, you know what Tyler Mott brings. Yeah. 
The um, fans would love it. That's for sure. <laughs> I know. And then they'd be clamoring. And then, and then over the summer, when Drury doesn't keep him with a with a <laughs> year, you know, deal for fourteen million, you know, <laughs> not understanding that you know, there's a cap. <laughs> Well, uh, in, in addition to the day being busy, one last move that did happen uh, was Will Cooley going back, being dropped down. Just getting your reaction on, I guess, his his short stint here with the Rangers. It's probably better off that that he gets dropped back down, just get more reps. I mean, he is young and um, shows some promise, but obviously, you know, it's it's probably better for him to get a little more time and development, right? Oh, I agree completely. Um, I, I don't, you know, uh, unless he... Unless he just, you know, asserted himself in in these eight or ten minutes a night, um, and he established himself as a fourth line guy who they were going to carry into the playoffs, it's much better for him and for the team for him to play in Hartford, get his eighteen to twenty two minutes a night, and he's always available to come back at any time. Um, I I thought it was, you know, I I thought he was impressive. Um, I thought he handled himself well. He and the fourth line had a very tough night against Vancouver. So did the third pair. It was, it was just a bad night, but it, it wasn't a good night really for anybody. Um, even though the, you know the Rangers won the game against the Canucks, um, he had a he had a tough night, and um, I think I think it is a really good experience for him. Um, I think it will prepare him if he's recalled, and certainly he'll be back. Um, you know, for the playoffs, if um, if the Rangers, you know, make recalls for the playoffs, which they will. Um, and and uh, I think it was a win win for him to be up. But it, it's it's not um, you know, you don't want, a, you know, a young guy playing seven minutes a night. You just don't. Um, so I, th- I think it's good. I think I think it was good. He was here. I think it's good that he's back and he could be back for the playoffs. He could play in the playoffs. We don't you know, we don't know depending on what Drury can do um, in picking up another fourth line player. Last one for you and Molly love if you could chime in on this one too, obviously Boston, they're the gold standard right now. They're having one of those historic kind of seasons, 39 wins, seven losses, 83 points, a great year. The immediate thought as soon as I saw this trade go down was how much does this close the gap between the Rangers and a team like the Bruins? So kind of curious, does this, I mean, it, it obviously makes the Rangers better, but how much does it close the gap in your mind? I mean, my more immediate thought, but this is also just me thinking as someone in the tri-state area, is you got the Islanders bringing in Bo Horvitt and the Rangers bringing in Tarasenko, and I'm looking at the Devils. Like, <laughs> like what are they going to do? What's going to go on with them? But they still have such a, a comfortable few points on the Rangers right now in the Metro. Um, but that's just where my mind went because, I mean, you look at the players that the Metro is bringing in, and it's just becoming more and more of a bloodbath. I think that the Devils, I mean, the Bruins are just, you know, kind of just having one of those seasons where it's just so special. And right now they're they're just rolling and it's kind of, you know, one of those that are difficult to stop unless something catastrophic happens. Um, in terms of closing the gap between them, how they match up, I definitely think it helps. You know, be, the Bruins are the same way and having so many scoring threats on each line. Um, and I think that like Larry said, it does balance the Rangers top nine out a little bit more and it gives them more of a different look because Tarasenko is, you know, also a kind of a big body, you know, kind of guy that'll get to the paint and crash the net um, rather than just score fancy goals like some of the other uh, players in the top nine for the Rangers. So um, I don't know, it's difficult to say exactly how they match up, but I'm just looking at how crazy the Metro has gotten over the last couple of weeks and it's exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, that's a good point. And, and, um, I think that, I think it, 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 it improves them incrementally, but if Tarasenko improves the power play, that's going to be a key area because, um, if you're going to, if, if, if a team is, you know, playing against the Bruins, you're going to have to score in the power play. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you, you know, so, you know, if he aids the power play, then, then that's an advantage for them. Um, it, he, I think he makes them better. I think he makes their, you know, their team more formidable. Um, you know, they, they've got to get through, they're going to have to get through a couple of teams before they get to Boston. Right. And, you know, assuming they finish in the top three and and don't slide to a wild card. 
So they're going to have to win two rounds before they get to the Bruins. So they they may you know they may want to worry about <laughs> that you know, at a later date. Jersey date. <laughs> and Carolina and, and you know and, and you know and and Tampa if, if you know however however it would work out they they've got a lot of work to do before they get to Boston. I think I I don't uh, um, I don't know that the deal was made with Boston in mind. But again, if you have a better first line, if you have uh, um, if this um, if this uh, jump starts Panarin, then they're a much better team and they have a much better shot against the Bruins. I, I think Panarin's just a huge factor here. Right. You know, yeah, he, he's there. They they can't. They're not going to win yeah. the Stanley Cup if Panarin doesn't have a good playoffs. He's they're, the they're, guy. Yeah, you know, they're going to need him to be better than he was last year. And if Tarasenko can be a part of that, then 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 great. We shall see. We shall see. <laughs> Hockey Hall of Famer Larry Brooks. Thank you so much for breaking this down and everything. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. Right. Thanks.